Hello, and welcome back. Today we're looking at Chapter 9, Section 1, Washington Takes Office. And this coincides with pages 278 to 283 in our textbook. So if you want to have that open while we go through today's lesson, that might be a pretty good idea. But our essential question for today, as Washington takes office, is what did George Washington do to build the office of president? Um, as the first president, there wasn't anybody before him to give him an idea of what to do, so he kind of had to figure things out as he went along. And as you can see, I've already done an audio recording of each section of today's lesson. So if you want to use that, that's perfectly fine. Or if you just want to read through on your own, also perfectly fine. But if not, let's get back to our video for today. Now, some of our key terms for today and some of the things that we will actually uh, be talking about in the future as well, but it's good to have a definition of some of these terms. Um, let's look at them. Uh, inauguration, that's the ceremony in which a president officially takes the oath of office. Precedent, not to be confused with president. Precedent is an act or decision that sets an example for others to follow. So as the first president, Washington had to set a precedent for the president, but we'll get into that in the future. Uh, cabinet, national debt, bond, Bank of the United States, tariff, and whiskey rebellion. And these are all things that we will talk about today and some things that we will talk about in future lessons. But as we start, I have a question for you. How many of you are the first child in your family? You're the oldest, the eldest. I am the eldest in my family. It's I, it's just the two of us, myself and my sister Becky, who's pictured right here. Uh, and all growing up, as the oldest kid in the family, I was the first one to do everything. I was the first to go to elementary school, the first to go to high school, the first to go to college, the first one to play sports, the first one to take piano lessons, the first one to drive, and so on and so on and so on. You see the pattern here? Uh, I didn't have an older brother or an older sister to kind of show me the ropes and tell me what was going to be expected of me. So I had to find out for myself. And this picture is actually from about a year ago. It's my sister and I cutting potatoes for Thanksgiving. And uh, as you can see, we both have kind of the same expression on our face of we need to make sure these potatoes are cut correctly. And uh, this picture really doesn't have anything to do with anything. I just like it because uh, it shows that we kind of had some, some similarities. And uh, I just like the same ex intense expression that we both have on our face. Uh, and the potatoes were delicious. But what does this have to do with U.S. history? Well, I, met, I clued you in, but just like I had to be the first in my family to do everything, George Washington, as the first president, had to really figure out what it is that a president actually does. Uh, there were no other presidents before him to leave him a little sticky note, say, hey, George, uh, here's some things to keep in mind as you wake up every day and you're the president. Uh, kind of had to figure it out on his own. But as we're going to see, uh, he did have some help. So let's let's get into our lesson for today now soon after Washington's inauguration which like I said an inauguration is the ceremony in which the president officially takes the official oath of office so once Washington was inaugurated then he was officially the president of the United States soon after that he and some others realized that even though the Constitution provided a framework for the government and said these are what the president's duties are supposed to be, they didn't really explain what he was going to do day to day. He had kind of the a framework, like the big ideas of, all right, I need to do this and this. I need to. I'm responsible for carrying out the nation's laws. But what does that really mean? And how does that translate into waking up every day and fulfilling my roles and responsibilities as president. There was no precedent. Uh, 
which would set the actions of the president. So it was really up to Washington to figure out what uh, the president was going to do day to day. And it was pretty clear from the beginning that the president was going to need help. And he was going to need a group of talented and uh, intelligent people around him to help him carry out the duties of the executive the executive branch. So in 1789, Congress created five departments within the executive branch, and the heads of these departments would make up the president's cabinet. And this isn't a cabinet like you find in the kitchen. This just refers to the president's official group of advisors. And Washington set a precedent by choosing well-known leaders of the day to serve in his cabinet. So at the head of the State Department, he chose Thomas Jefferson to serve as the Secretary of State. And to head up the Treasury, he chose Alexander Hamilton, and we'll talk about Hamilton in just a few minutes. As the head of the War Department, he chose Henry Knox, who was a very famous uh, colonial general from the Revolutionary War. Edmund Randolph, he chose as the Attorney General. And at the head of the Post Office, the Postmaster General, Mr. Samuel Osgood. And our first video is going to go into a little bit more detail about setting the precedents uh, very early in his uh in his uh, presidency and some of the early things that George Washington did to kind of establish the job of President of the United States. It was April 14, 1789, and the Constitution had finally been ratified. At Mount Vernon, George Washington's plantation home in Virginia, the 57-year-old general was handed a letter telling him he had been chosen as president of the brand new Union of States. He would need to depart for his inauguration on the very next morning. About 10 o'clock, I bade farewell to Mount Vernon and to private life. And with a mind oppressed with more anxious and painful sensations that I have words to express, set out for New York. It took Washington eight days to make the 235-mile journey to New York, which was to be the capital until a new one could be built. All along the way, citizens greeted their president-elect with parades and bonfires and fireworks and speeches and banquets. At his swearing-in at New York's Federal Hall, Washington promised to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be drawn into precedent. Right away, Washington appointed advisors who became known as the Cabinet. He picked the very best people he could find. For Secretary of State, he chose Thomas Jefferson. For Secretary of the Treasury, it was Alexander Hamilton. What developed were the nation's first political parties. Jefferson and his followers became known as Democratic Republicans. Hamilton and his followers became known as Federalists. What they really represent is a, two competing visions of what the future of the country ought to be, and freedom is related to that. The Federalists want a powerful national state with a developing economy, sort of modeled on Great Britain. To them, freedom comes through national greatness and economic development. To the Jeffersonians, they want a limited government. They want America to be a land-based power, not a financial power and a military power. To them, freedom means limited government, individual opportunity. So in a sense, unlike some other periods in our history, the parties really represent very, very different visions of what America ought to be. I promised that we would be talking about Alexander Hamilton very shortly, and here he is. Now, right off the bat, as the Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton faced a lot of financial issues, and the most important was the huge national debt that the country had accrued during the Revolutionary War. And accrued just means increased over time. And again, this is one of the issues that show 
the shortcomings of the Articles of Confederation is that the country couldn't raise taxes and uh, the country was really failing financially. And during the Revolutionary War, the country had needed money to buy supplies, and to pay soldiers, so they borrowed a lot of this money from foreign countries and from ordinary citizens. And the way that the government borrowed from citizens was by selling bonds. And bonds are certificates that promise to repay the amount of money that was loaned plus interest on a certain future date. So if I were to buy a bond for a hundred dollars, I would do so. The money would then use the, the government would then use that money to do whatever. And then once the bond was up in seven or ten years or however, however many, I would expect them to give me that money back plus interest. So I pay a hundred dollars and I expect to get a hundred and twenty or hundred and fifty dollars back in the future, something like that. So Hamilton proposed to combat the national debt by having the government buy up all of the bonds that had been issued before 1789 and then issue new bonds to pay off the old debts. And once the economy started to improve, then the government would be able to start paying off those new bonds. So kind of use money, bought up the old bonds, and then use those old bonds to pay, pay towards new new bonds so it, it's kind of confusing but at the time uh, it made sense to some people and some people really welcomed that plan and said hey let's we need to do something to try and jumpstart the economy but others most notably led by James Madison were opposed to this Hamilton argued that unless the United States could repay its debts in full then it would lose the trust of future investors and that those investors were crucial to the country growing in the future and building the nation's economy. But Madison, as a Southerner, was opposed to Hamilton's plan to pay off all the state debts because a lot of the Southern states had already paid off their debts and they didn't want to be burdened with the debts of other states. So this was a kind of an issue of the country as a whole versus individual states and this is a this issue of states rights over national rights is going to come up again in the very very near future so keep that back there in the sticky part of your brain but something had to had to happen in order for the country to move forward so hamilton in order to gain support of the southern states proposed to support their desire to have the nation's capital in the South in exchange for Southern support in helping to repay, repay those debts. So in 1790, Congress voted to accept Hamilton's plan to build the new capital city. And currently, the capital was New York City, but the new national capital would be built right in the middle of the country in on land donated from both Maryland and Virginia, and it would be called the District of Columbia after Christopher Columbus. So while the District of Columbia was being constructed, the capital moved from New York City down to Philadelphia. So it was, our nation's capital has been New York City, Philadelphia, and most notably DC, or as we know it now, Washington DC. In January of 1790, the U.S. Congress met here at the Pennsylvania State House in Philadelphia, the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed. This building was to serve as the country's temporary capital while decisions about a new U.S. capital city were made. In 1790, one of the most urgent orders of business for the U.S. government was to come up with a way to repay long overdue debts incurred during the Revolutionary War, including such things as the back pay owed to soldiers. Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton worked out a controversial repayment plan to meet this goal. 
But certain congressmen would only accept his plan if he arranged to have the new U.S. capital city built in the southern part of the country. A location in Maryland pictured here was decided upon and Hamilton's repayment plan was passed. Then, not far from here along the banks of the Potomac River, President Washington selected the exact site where the federal city would someday stand. So the first challenge raise money to pay off the war debts Im Im pretty immediately. And Hamilton did that with the bond issue. His next major challenge in order to try and strengthen the failing econ economy was he wanted to try and strengthen both agriculture and industry. And he did so by asking Congress to create a national bank. And in 1791, the Bank of the United States was formed. And this, we're looking at a picture of the first national bank of the United States. And this bank would hold money that was deposited from taxes and would issue paper money to pay the government's bills. Uh, it was also able to make loans to farmers and businesses and encourage economic growth through these loans. And so the bank would help agriculture and help business. He also wanted to help American manufacturers uh, by proposing a very high tariff. And a tariff is a tax on imported goods. And we'll talk about tariffs in the future, but I just want you, for the time being, to know that he wanted to pass a very high tax on imported goods so that foreign goods would be much more expensive than American-made goods. And he hoped that by doing so, it would encourage people to buy uh, locally made uh, things and things made by American manufacturers. And in the North, where it's kind of the North was kind of the hub of industry, this ta this tariff was everyone loved it. Uh, but in the South, people in the South tended to depend much more heavily on your especially European goods. So they were very opposed to this tariff. So after some arguing back and forth, Congress did end up passing a tariff, but it was much lower than the one that Hamilton had initially intended. In 1791, Congress approved the creation of a privately owned bank called the Bank of the United States to handle the federal government's money. Alexander Hamilton had personally worked to have this bank created for he believed it would help strengthen the government politically and economically. But Thomas Jefferson deeply opposed the bank believing it to be a government supported monopoly. Soon another issue arose that divided these two men. For Hamilton wanted the federal government to take an active role in promoting the development of American industry. And Jefferson did not. At this time, industrialization was just beginning to take hold in America. In fact, the factory in Rhode Island seen here, called Slater's Mill, opened right around the same time Hamilton was making his proposals to Congress. It was the first factory in the nation where water-powered machines were put to use in textile manufacturing. Machines like those in Slater's Mill had brought tremendous wealth to Great Britain, and Hamilton wanted the same thing to happen in the United States. To achieve this goal, Hamilton wanted the federal government to make payments to people who opened new factories and to enact protective tariffs, special taxes on imported goods. Under this plan, there would be an added incentive to build factories. And untaxed American manufactured goods would become more affordable than similar foreign products upon which taxes were paid. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were disgusted with Hamilton's plan, saying it represented unnecessary government interference. It was their belief that the federal government should play only a small role in the lives of the American people. Furthermore, Jefferson believed that massive industrialization would breed poverty and the growth of crowded, unhealthy cities. 
In contrast to Hamilton, Jefferson envisioned an American nation based on small, independent farms. So right off the bat, the biggest issue was getting the government to raise money. And uh, one of the ways that they did so, we're actually going to talk about right now. Uh, In order to try and raise money for the Treasury, Congress approved a tax on all liquor that was made and sold within the country. But instead of raising money, this tax sparked a rebellion, which is why we're going to be talking about the Whiskey Rebellion, among Western Pennsylvania farmers. These farmers grew corn, and because corn can be difficult to transport over rough roads, uh, there's, there's a very short time window between picking corn and being able to sell it while it's still fresh. So since this was an issue for a lot of the farmers living back then, they, they were having difficulty getting it back to the markets back, back east. So a lot of them would convert their corn into whiskey because the whiskey would, it would hold a lot longer. It was easier to ship and you could generate a really, really a a decent profit by uh, converting your corn to whiskey instead of just selling it as corn. So kind of made sense for the farmers, but with this tax, uh, they weren't too keen on it. As you can see from this flag, uh, the farmers hated the whiskey tax and refused to pay it because they believed that it was no better than the taxes that Great Britain had put on them years earlier. Personally, I I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, Wasn't one of the reasons we'd fought the Revolutionary War in the in the beginning because people were angry about taxes and angry about British taxation. So liberty or death, uh, this is the liberty flag, which was used during the Whiskey Rebellion, and it was one of the flags used at this time. And I think it's important also to notice that it, uh, instead of 13 stripes, it has 15 stripes, because at this time, the country had grown to 15 states. But that's, that's, that's extra. So in 1784, when officials tried to go and collect this tax, a lot of the farmers rebelled. Thousands marched and protested through the streets of Pittsburgh, sang revolutionary songs, and they pulled out that old, that old trick from before the Revolutionary War of tarring and feathering the tax collectors, which left Washington with a choice of what to do. Either let this continue or act quickly. So he chose to act quickly in response to the uprising and dispatched a militia to Pennsylvania. And when these rebelling farmers heard that troops were coming after them, they threw down their arms and fled back to their farms. So Washington issues the militia to come out. The farmers hear that the militia is on their way, so rebellion over. Hamilton wanted the leaders of this rebellion to be imprisoned, but Washington chose to let them go, chose to pardon them. And in this one act, by choosing to choosing to act quickly, but also choosing to pardon them, he had shown strength and mercy in this one act. And Washington proved to the American citizens that the new government would act swiftly in times of crisis and that violence would not be tolerated, but that they would also show a human side and show mercy where necessary. As the United States government worked at solving its problems with France and Britain, Trouble developed at home in the normally peaceful farm country of western Pennsylvania and Kentucky. People in these areas raised wheat, corn, and rye, and they used some of the grain to make whiskey. It was perfectly legal to make whiskey, but U.S. law said that persons who did so had to pay a tax. In fact, tax on alcohol was an important source of income for the federal government back in the 1790s. But many farmers refused to pay the tax. They even committed violence against the federal tax collectors, setting off what has come to be called the Whiskey Rebellion. To put an end to the rebellion, President Washington sent 15,000 U.S. troops into the region. This large show of force soon convinced the farmers to pay the taxes. 
and the rebels also were required to sign the document seen here, in which they agreed to respect the laws of the United States. And so, by taking swift military action against the Whiskey Rebellion, the American government made it clear that it would not tolerate activities that violated national laws. Which brings us to our assignment for today. Now, now that you have completed the lesson, I want you to go back through and answer the following questions. Number one, what were the first five executive departments of the federal government? The cabinet. Number two, how did Alexander Hamilton propose to repay the national debt? And how did his opposition respond? Number three, what compromise brought about the acceptance of Hamilton's plan? Number four, what steps did the government take to try and strengthen the economy? Number five, what was the purpose of the tax on whiskey? So the, the, specifically, what was the purpose of it? And not just whiskey, but all liquor made within the United States. And number six, how did the Whiskey Rebellion reveal George Washington's concern with national security? And this one will, it will take some interpretation based on the crisis and Washington's response to the crisis. I want you to answer each of these with complete sentences. It's, it's pretty straightforward, um, but if it asks for an explanation, I want you to please give a full explanation. If, and I say this a lot, but if you feel like you're writing too much, that's a good thing. All right. If you have any questions, please come and find me and I'll do my best to help you out. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day.